Um, so first of all, thanks, Francesco, for this very nice uh, <laughs> introduction. Uh, so as mentioned, the topic of the talk will be on visual generative models as queryable uh, world um, models. And it's a honor for me to be uh, among all of you today. So uh, I wanted to start with a slight look back over the last four or five years of what uh, ha has happened in the field of generative models. And those are some examples of the generative models that we had not so long ago, ago between 2019 and 2021. Uh, back then, we considered a very good model, uh, the kind of models that could generate uh, single objects in the middle uh, of the, the picture at relatively high, by back then, uh, resolution, not as high as nowadays, of course. Uh, but the level of control that these uh, generative models had was only through the class label. So we were conditioning the model with the object label and uh, getting generations out of it. So that was back in 2019, roughly a couple of years later, 2021, the field had already uh, fast-tracked uh, quite significantly with uh, very decent text-to-image models. And you see an example of that below, even though maybe nowadays these results uh, don't look as impressive as the ones that uh, we have uh, from the most recent models. Uh, still, it was like a huge uh, advancement for the field. And we see that the generations are quite decent, uh, although like if we take, uh, for example, uh, the first one, a very uh, cute uh, cat laying by a big bike, uh, sometimes like some of the concepts, concepts get uh, sort of entangled uh, with uh, each other. But then if we keep uh, moving forward, uh, the models that we've seen over the last year and a half or so have boosted the, the quality of the generations even more uh, impressively. And so here you have uh, examples of some of the recent models. Those are text to image models. So the level of control is through the text prompt uh, in most of the cases. And uh, the level of detail and uh, the resolution that these models achieves is quite uh, impressive. Uh, we can also see how these models are able to generate uh, images that uh, have different uh, styles, uh, such as the ones on the um, right side of the slide. And even more recently, so those are the most uh, recent models that I'm going to be showing on the slides. So we see that the quality has, boost, has been boosted even farther for uh, these models. And uh, we have models that not only yield very high quality images, but uh, also these images are consistent with the input uh, prompt. And so that's what we see here, for example, with the alpaca made of colorful building blocks, uh, cyberpunk. Um, but there are many other examples as well. And so these advancements that we have experienced in the generative modeling space uh, raise the question as to whether we can use these generative models as a compressed representation of a data set and use them as uh, the data sources to train the downstream, any downstream machine learning model. And so uh, as you all know, um, this, many of the high-performing machine learning models have been trained on large-scale, uh, internet-scale uh, data sets. And so we, what I'm trying to convey in this slide is that how we can move beyond these static data sets uh, that we gather from the internet and think of these machine learning models depicted on the slide as machine learning models 2.0, where this machine learning model 2.0 can be any machine learning model, so it can be a uh, recognition model, a representation learning model, or any foundational model. This model is data hungry and has the ability to come up with queries to gather data. So we can think of it as an active acquisition or active learning kind of scenario. And the model never stops learning and uses its acquired knowledge in order to decide what is useful in order to improve its own performance. On the other uh, side of the slide, we have the model of the world. This model of the world, uh, in our case, and for the purpose of the talk, it will be uh, a conditional generative model. And uh, this conditional generative model provides an infinite data source, and it can be queried by steering the model to produce um, any examples that are used to tr useful to train the downstream machine learning model 2.0. And so we have this interaction between the two models, the machine learning model that is being trained and that during training requests um, specific kinds of data to the model of the world in order to uh, keep training and improve its own performance. And we have the model of the world that keeps providing this data to the machine learning model. 
And so over the last year and a half or so, we've seen a bunch of uh, literature which has uh, tried to take one step in this direction and has tried to leverage these um, state-of-the-art conditional image generative models as sources of data. Most of the time by providing a set of uh, text prompts from a fixed data set uh, to condition the generative process and getting data from there uh, in order to train the downstream machine learning model. And so uh, this takes me to the uh, index of this talk. So uh, we will focus the talk into two different uh, parts. The first part will be trying to address the following question, which is are state-of-the-art image generative models optimized to work as world models? And in this context, uh, we will show a bunch of work that has been done in trying to understand the progress of uh, image generative models beyond the quality that uh, we all observed uh, in the generations, and then how can we improve those axes of performance which are still not uh, as advanced as others. Then uh, the second question that I will try to uh, address in this talk or start addressing in this talk, talk is how do, can we query or how can we control the generative model in order to produce samples that are useful to train this machine learning model downstream. So let's start with the first part on understanding the progress of image generative models and uh, on that uh, topic I will cover uh, three different uh, analysis contributions that we've had over the past uh, year and a half. Just to ground uh, the work that will come uh, after, uh, the talk will be grounded on image generative model, conditional image generative models. And so we all, all of the um, works will work with the assumption that we have text prompts that we feed the generative model with, and uh, the generation process yields uh, an image that reflects uh, what was requested in the, in the, in the initial prompt. And so if we think of these generative models as world models, and we think of the characteristics of what could, uh, have, could be a good world model, uh, we think the following. So world models should yield high, high utility representations. By high utility in the context of image generative models, I mean uh, high quality or highly realistic images. These, mm, these generations yield by the model should be consistent with the input conditioning. What I mean by that is that the generations should reflect what was requested through the prompt, and uh, the generation should produce diverse, uh, the generation process should provide uh, diverse samples. So this means that provided a given text prompt, we want the generative model to come up with diverse um, generations. However, the state-of-the-art generative models that we have uh, nowadays have been mostly optimized for human preference. And so here are some examples of uh, what happens when we prompt the models with different uh, prompts. So the first uh, case here is the prompt two dogs and a cat. And we may all agree that the generations are all high quality and they all contain dogs and cats, but none of them contains exactly what was request requested through the user prompt. Beyond that, if we start prompting the models with uh, prompts such as a house in Europe, a house in Africa, or a house in South America, this is the results that we get. So if we take a look at a, the generations for a house in Europe, we see that there is a common pattern in the kind of houses that the model depicts, and the diversity is uh, relatively low. The same uh, happens when prompting the model with a house in Africa. We see these urban areas, um, relatively low diversity in the generations. And the same for a house in South America, where we see these uh, colorful patterns that appear in all of the generations. And so we've talked about uh, generative models. We've talked about how uh, they may be used as world models, and we enumerated three characteristics of what could constitute a good world model. So yielding high utility representations, high quality images, highly realistic images, yielding re re um, representations or images that are consistent with the input condition conditioning, so with the text prompt, and um, yielding diversity of the generations. And so we have these three axes of performance, and I wanted to uh, go over some background metrics first on how can we quantify uh, those. 
And uh, for that, I'll introduce two kinds of uh, scores. I'll start with these overall uh, scores, which um, basically consider data sets of real images and data sets of generated images and marginalize over all the text prompts. So the most commonly used metric, which I won't uh, cover today, in the generative modeling space is the FID score. And the FID score basically assumes that we have a, a data set of real images to compare to and a data set of generated images. And uh, we see uh, how, um, whether this, how close these two distributions of data sets uh, are. However, FID usually entangles the two, two of the dimensions that I uh, explained earlier. So basically, if FID captures uh, image quality and uh, image diversity as well. Um, of course, image quality and diversity in this case are defined by this reference um, data set of real images. And so if we think of these three axes of performance, we are more interested in metrics that can disentangle image quality and uh, image diversity. And so that's what I'm going to be presenting uh, next. So what metrics can we use for the utility? So to capture image quality or Im image realism. Uh, so one way of thinking about these metrics is uh, thinking of the following question as a proxy for image quality, which is how many generated samples lie close to real uh, reference uh, data points. And this is what has been introduced in the literature as the precision metric, and which is depicted now on the slide. Um, so how do we compute precision is we have a data set of real images. So again, it's a metric that is based uh, on a reference data set. And so the quality is defined by the content, content of this real data set. And then we have a data set of generated uh, images. And what we try to compute here is the number of uh, generated images that fall within the manifold of the real images. And how do we do that? So we start with this set of uh, real images, and now we will estimate the manifold of these real images. And we do that by building hyperspheres around all of the real um, data points that we have. The way we build these uh, hyperspheres is by computing the kth uh, nearest neighbor for each one of these uh, data points. And so once we have estimated this um, real data manifold, we can project degenerated images onto the manifold and see how many of them, what's the proportion of them that fall within the real manifold of data. So in this case, we see that we have three out of six of the generated images that fall within the um, data set, uh, the real manifold uh, that we have estimated. Uh, for diversity, there are many different ways uh, that we compute the diversity. So there is the option of computing recall. Uh, recall is the analogous version of precision, So, in but instead of computing the proportion of generated samples that lie within the manifold of the real data, we compute the opposite. So the number of real samples that lie within the manifold of generated data, where the manifold of generated data is uh, computed in a similar, in the same way as I explained uh, earlier. However, uh, today I want to put focus on a slightly different metric, which is uh, the diversity defined as the number or the proportion of real data points that have generated samples nearby. And this is what is known in the literature as coverage. And this is how it is defined. So again, we start with a data set of real images, a data set of generated images. And here we want to count, if re you remember the hyperspheres that we built in order to estimate the manifolds of the real data, we want to count how many of these hyperspheres contain um, generated data. And so going back to the illustration that we had, uh, before, in this case, we have uh, one, data, one generated data point that lies in two different hyperspheres and two other generated um, data points that lie within another uh, hyperspheres. So this is uh, the concept of, of uh, coverage. And this we will use as a proxy for uh, diversity. Again, this diversity is uh, grounded on the definition of diversity provided by the reference data set. And so now that we have uh, introduced this, um, this overall realis realism and uh, diversity scores, let's see how we can define the prompt specific score. So note that I didn't introduce any consistency uh, score so far and because consistency uh, is it can only exist with the prompt specific score because consistency tries to measure uh, how faithful the generations are to the input prompt. 
And so let's see uh, here variations of uh, metrics that can capture image quality or utility, diversity, and con consistency in a prop spe prompt specific way. So for uh, utility or uh, realism, here we ask the following question as a proxy to that, which is how similar generated images are to a reference set of real images. And this is a similarity-based uh, score, and the way we compute it is as follows. So we start again with a real um, image and a generated image. We project them into some embedding space, and we compute a similarity score on top of it, for example, the cosine similarity. You'll note that there is the max here. This is uh, based on the assumption that for each prompt, we will have several uh, generated images. And among those generated images, we want to see which one is the closest to the one that we have in the real data set. Now, if we move to diversity, we can build diversity in a similar uh, way, so it's been a sim by leveraging a similarity-based uh, metric. And here the question is how similar are generated samples from a given prompt? So here we won't need any reference image. Instead, given a text prompt, we'll generate several images, and we want to know how similar these generations are to each other. And so here is how uh, we can compute diversity by leveraging a similarity-based metric. So again, we start with some images. In this case, two images uh, that are generated and come from the same text prompt. Uh, we embed them in some uh, space and compute similarity between the two of them. Um, here, uh, we want uh, to have them as dissimilar as possible to have high diversity. And uh, if we move to the concept of consistency, there are different ways that we can measure one, and there are two um, more established ways uh, in the community. So the question here is, do generated images follow their respective prompts? And one way to capture that is by leveraging the CLIP score. Um, so for the CLIP score, what we need is a prompt and a generated image. We will embed the prompt, the text prompt, by leveraging the CLIP text encoder, and we will embed the generated image by leveraging the CLIP uh, image encoder, and then we will uh, compute the CLIP score based on that. So again, a similarity-based metric. But for prompt consistency, there are also these uh, VQA-based uh, metrics. And what these metrics try to do is the following. So they start with the text prompt. Then from the text prompt, they generate questions and uh, their associated answers. And once we have the, the generations com coming from the text prompt, we will leverage a VQA model with the image and the questions to assess the answer. And this can be questions, for example, related to the presence of uh, an object that was requested through the user prompt. And so now that uh, I gave you the background of all of the metrics that will be relevant to the talk, let's move on to the uh, analysis um, that um, I introduced earlier. So trying to understand whether generative models can be used as world models. So for this first uh, work, which we called uh, DIGIN, we developed three indicators which are focused on uh, assessing the geographic diversity of the generations. Uh, so we call these uh, DIGIN indicators since we measure disparities in the image generations. So the first indicator that uh, we introduced is the region indicator. So this indicator compares a reference data set with a set of generated uh, images. And uh, we care here about the axis of um, diversity and realism. So we will use precision and coverage that we have introduced before as proxy for that. Uh, so remember that precision, what uh, it's measuring is the, the realism. And it's calculated as the proportion of generated images that fall within the manifold of uh, the estimated manifold of the real images. And uh, coverage is used to measure diversity and it counts the proportion of real images that have generated images nearby. Um, so these results that we're presenting here are for uh, different um, generative models. So each dot corresponds to a different generative model. And sometimes these generative models uh, are prompted in different ways. So uh, the kind of prompts that you're using to uh, prompt the generative models are uh, text prompts such as an object in a region. So for example, a car in Africa or a car in Europe. And we do that for many um, standard uh, items that we use every day. 
And so uh, what we see here, uh, I'm showing like the results for two specific regions, notably for Africa and for uh, Europe. And what we see here is that some regions uh, tend to exhibit lower precision than others. So that is the case of Africa versus Europe. And we observe similar trends uh, for uh, diversity, where we see that the lowest um, coverage that appears for Africa is lower than the lowest coverage that we obtain for um, Europe. Now, the second indicator is the region object indicator. This is a, same, a similar indicator, but instead of operating at region level, it operates at object region level. So it's sort of a zoomed in version of the previous um, indicator. And so this allows us to identify possible patterns that might happen at object level rather than at uh, region level. And here I'm exemplifying uh, the, the kind of behaviors that we observe with some examples. So the first column of images that is shown on the slide corresponds to real images coming from a data set. And uh, I'm showing real images of cars in Africa and real images of cooking pots in Africa. The second column is uh, the, the generations from a state-of-the-art generative model when prompted to generate cars in Africa or cooking pots in Africa. The third uh, column will be the real images of the same objects uh, for uh, Europe. And the fourth column will be the generations associated with the concepts in Europe. So what we observe here is uh, if we take a look at the real uh, images for cars in Africa, those are sedan-like uh, cars uh, that appear in urban areas. However, what the generative model uh, comes up with, and here is a, a two sample out of like a, what, what could be a, a larger one just uh, because of space constraints. What happens here is that the generative model tends to generate SUV-like vehicles, most of them in rudimentary conditions and in rural backgrounds. However, if we see what happens uh, for Europe, we see that, um, again, the real images contain sedan-like cars in urban settings. However, the gen and the generated images uh, are closer to the ones that are represented in the uh, real data. So again, sedan-like cars in uh, urban areas. So we see the kind of disparities uh, that um, these uh, generative state-of-the-art generative models uh, present. Similar observations can be made for the cooking pot uh, in Africa versus the generations of the cooking pot in Europe. And uh, the third and final indicator is related to the consistency metric that we talked about. So here, because we're only caring about the set of objects, we care about the consistency metric from the perspective of this uh, object only. Uh, what we observe here is that there are like some of state-of-the-art models that are much more consistent than others. And what happens here when we prompt uh, the models with uh, prompts such as a bag in Africa or a bag in Europe or a um, hat in Africa or a hat in Europe is that some models uh, do not uh, take into account the object present in the prompt when there is some regional information introduced uh, in the prompt. So we see that um, for Africa, when there is no object present, most of the time we see these rural backgrounds, sometimes even with some uh, animals like elephants appearing on them, whereas uh, for Europe, we see these uh, colorful buildings with cobblestone pavement, uh, and so on. And even when the objects appear, sometimes they appear in these outdoors uh, kind of uh, sceneries as well. So now that I briefly introduced the indicators, let's see uh, some of these findings that we were discussing in a summarized uh, way. So first, state-of-the-art models exhibit performance disparities in real-world geographic representation. Um, notably, we've seen that existing models often have mm, less realism and diversity for uh, some regions when prompted for regions such as Africa, also West Asia, which I didn't cover in the slides, um, than for other regions such as Europe. Prompting with geographic information, so prompting with an object in region versus prompting exclusively for the object without the original information comes at the cost of prompt consistency. And we've seen that for some of the models that focus on the regional information more than on the object uh, information. And it also comes at the cost of the generation uh, diversity as we've, seen, as we've seen with the coverage indicators. Um, some models exhibit more region level disparities for some objects than others. 
and of notable uh, concern, we see from all the three indicators that the progress in image quality has come at the cost of real world geographic representation. And so in follow-up work, uh, what we did is focused on decomposing, decomposing the previous digging into indicators into um, object and uh, background in order to capture the representation via specific components of the image, uh, such as buildings that are present in the background or uh, natural vegetation or stylization of some of the uh, central objects. Uh, how we did that is we took the same set of real images and uh, the generated images. We segmented the um, object uh, of interest and we ended up with the background part and the object uh, part separately so we could extract features on the background and the object uh, separately and compute the same um, indicators that I uh, described in the previous slide. So that, what did we learn uh, by doing that? Well, first, uh, we learned that realism tends to be higher for objects than for uh, backgrounds. And uh, this is not necessarily the case when it comes to um, diversity or coverage. Um, so on the plot that I just um, that, that just appeared on the slide, uh, we have uh, precision and recall values for a model uh, stratified uh, by different regions and stratified by whether those are results for background or for uh, foreground uh, objects. And so uh, what we see here is that the background exhibits uh, almost twice a larger disparity than um, the, what, what we observe for objects the, 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 in terms of coverage. And so this decomposition allowed us to pinpoint some of the examples of disparities that I have already highlighted in the previous slide. But just to uh, recall them again, uh, what they allowed us to pinpoint is the stereotypical backgrounds that appear for some regions, such as for Africa, how some models struggle um, to generate modern objects, such as vehicles in some regions, and the unrealistic placing of objects in the outdoor settings, such as the bag or the hat that we've seen. And so uh, with that, like in this work, we had like this explicit uh, focus on the geographic representation diversity, but we wanted to understand how broad this diversity uh, issue was in um, state-of-the-art uh, conditional generative models. And so tie, and we wanted to tie these findings with uh, the question of whether these generative models could actually be leveraged as world models. And so uh, if we recall uh, from a couple of slides ago, we defined like these three axes of uh, performance for a, uh, a good world model. So a good world model should yield high quality uh, generations or high utility representations. Uh, it should be yield uh, consistent generations, so they should be prompt consistent. They should reflect well what was requested in the prompt, and they should be diverse. So given a text prompt, we want to observe that there is diversity in the generations. And so um, for a generative model to be a good world model, it should accurately and co comprehensively represent the real world. So. As discussed, this world modeling uh, problem is a multi-objective problem. And so as in any multi-objective problem, there might not be a single optimal solution to the problem because different objectives might be conflicting. Moreover, there is a set of optimal solution in the space of the objective function. And uh, this uh, set of optimal solution is uh, what we call the Pareto front. So uh, this means that no solution exhibits the best performance in all of the dimensions that we care about. So these solutions actually present some compromises. So these are solutions in which one of the objectives cannot be improved without uh, reducing another one of the objectives. So there are some trade-offs here to be taken into account. And the solutions that are not present in the Pareto front are considered suboptimal. So here are some of the uh, results of the Pareto Front's analysis. So let's take a look first at the consistency diversity um, Pareto Front. So what we observe here, we tried that for a bunch of um, models. And what we observe is that uh, when we 
we focus on consistency and diversity, only three out of the four models that we tried actually appear in the Pareto front. Um, what we observe here is that improvements in diversity come at the expense of um, problem consistency. And perhaps unsurprisingly, the most recent model, which in this case here is the XL model, reaches the best consistency. Now let's see what happens for the Pareto from of diversity realism. So when we look at diversity and realism, in this case, we also observe uh, this trade-off. So the higher diversity coincides with the lower uh, realism and vice versa. So perhaps unsurprisingly, again, the most recent model, which again is the Excel one, reaches the highest realism, but this is obtained at the expense of conditional diversity. Uh, there is a turbo, turbo version of the Excel uh, model, which achieves comparable results to the Excel model in terms of realism, but consider, considerably lower diversity. And this drop may be attributed in the way that this model is uh, trained. So it's, uh, it uses an adversarial objective to distill the Excel model into the turbo one. And this uh, translates into the, this seems to translate into this decrease of diversity. Now, if we look at the third Pareto front, so that's the realism consistency Pareto front. Uh, so when it comes to realism and consistency, what we observe is that the two show a relatively strong uh, correlation as improving improvements in one metric often translate into improvements in the other metric. So we observe that uh, the Pareto front here is dominated by the most recent model, so both by the XL and the XL Turbo model which highlights the advancements that we've made uh, in the field and that highlight how these uh, advancements have actually favored this consistency realism over the diversity axis. So as a sort of takeaways from this analysis, what we can see is that there is actually no single best model and that the choice of model should be determined based on the application, the downstream application that we care about then uh, realism and consistency both can be improved uh, simultaneously. And there is a clear trade-off that we observe between realism or consistency and uh, diversity. And we will now validate some of the observations that we've discussed um, qualitatively by showcasing some of the uh, results obtained by four models, which on the slide, I don't know if you can see it, but there are four models, A, B, C, and D, that I picked uh, to show you some uh, generations. So model A here is a model that exhibits uh, according to the plots high diversity and low consistency and low realism. Model B is a model that is in the middle frontier. And models C and D are models that exhibit high consistency and high realism, but low diversity according to these results. Um, so let's see some of these results. So these uh, are generations for the four models, A, B, C, and D, when prompted with the prompt two planes flying in the sky over a bridge. So uh, what we see here from model A, model A was the one that shined in diversity but exhibited the lowest uh, quality and consistency is that, well, yeah, the, the generations do actually have some diversity. We see diverse backgrounds, many different uh, colors, uh, objects, etc. cetera, but uh, we fail to see what we actually requested uh, in, the, in, the, in the prompt. If we move to model B, we still see that there is some diversity and some of the images contain the, the two planes or even the bridge in some cases. As we move to model C and D, we see that the diversity has drastically been reduced and that the variance in colors and backgrounds uh, has dra drastically uh, reduced. However, we do see that the quality of the generation and the faithfulness of the generation with respect to the prom has significantly increased in these cases. If we take a look at another example, so here are the same models when prompted with, uh, there is a dog holding a frisbee in its mouth, uh, we see similar patterns. So uh, for model A, we observe more diversity in the kind of dogs, the kind of uh, outdoor scenes, but in, not in all cases we observe dogs or dogs with a frisbee in their mouth. Um, for model B, we still observe some diversity and model B uh, is more consistent with the input prompt than models C and D. And as we 
uh, than model A, sorry. And as we move to C and D, we see that this consistency has further increased, as uh, has the image quality, but um, the diversity in the backgrounds and even the kind of dogs has uh, drastically uh, decreased in diversity. So we were wondering like, what this means in terms of the progress that we've made and recall that the question that we were trying to answer is whether um, this uh, state-of-the-art conditional imaginative model can be used as world uh, models. So I plotted here a few of the models uh, and the order that uh, they appeared in time. We tested many more of the models, but just uh, for briefly, I'm just considering uh, three of them uh, here. If you're interested in more of them, you can refer to, to the papers that we've been covering. Uh, so we go back to these three axes of uh, performance uh, to use these generative models as world models, so image realism or image quality, image diversity, and uh, prompt image uh, consistency. And what we have seen through the previous analysis is that we have done quite a bit of progress in uh, image quality between the first uh, model until the last uh, model that uh, we've tested. But what happened in terms of diversity is quite the opposite. So if we look at the models that we had two years ago, we see that their generations are much more diverse than the ones that we currently have. When it comes to prompt image consistency, we see also a positive trend that is in line with the image realism one. And so the conclusion of all of these analysis points that the progress in image quality that we've made has come at the cost of diversity, or representation diversity. And so in uh, follow-up work, what we wanted to study is uh, the variations in perception of these uh, evaluation uh, criteria. So how different people across the world vary or may vary in their perception of the uh, evaluation criteria that we have used to uh, make the previous analysis. And for that, uh, we collected 65K uh, annotations to study how annotators around the world vary in their perception of image representativeness, considering bo both object representativeness and background representativeness, object presence, and visual appeal. And we collected annotations that came from annotators that were based in the location where the images were taken when we considered real data and from the location where uh, that was prompted in the generated images. But we also consider annotations that were from annotators that were outside of the region of interest to see how their perceptions um, varied. And so let's see some of the results. So when focusing on the image representativeness, we found that annotators located in the same region as the real image, so where we know, knew that the image was taken, tend to identify both the object and the background in the real images as uh, representative of their region, more so than the annotators that are located outside of the region of interest. Um, and this is the case of uh, the example that is shown here with uh, could this uh, be a bag in uh, Europe. So annotators in Europe thought that uh, this was the case more often than annotators outside of um, Europe. Um, when the same question uh, was applied on generated images instead of on real images, the results were more mixed. So this is an example of what I mean by that. So could this be a cooking pot in Southeast Asia? So those are generated images as opposed to real images. And we see here that uh, annotators in uh, Southeast Asia don't think that this is a cooking pot that is representative of their region, whereas annotators outside of the regions think that this is a representative pot of that region. Um, now let's see what, it, what happens when it comes to background representativeness. Uh, so what we see here is that in-region annotators tend to indicate these realistic and non-differentiating visual qualities as a representative, representative of the region. So for example, in this case, um, what we observe is that when we are depicting these objects without any geographically associated patterns, like the plain uh, backgrounds that we see for the dogs, uh, or even interior spaces that do not have any food or item that is marking the region, then uh, the in-region annotators tend to think more often that this was a realistic uh, image or background of their own region. 
However, these perceptions of geographic representation differed based on where the annotator was located. Um, we next analyze the object presence. And so here we visualize examples in which the in-region annotators uh, say that the desired object is not shown, while the out-of-region annotators say that it is. So this is an example of uh, an image of a store prompt. So we prompted the generative model with, uh, in this particular case, with a store uh, front in Southeast Asia. And in this case, annotators in Southeast Asia, in general, do not think that this looks like a storefront in Southeast Asia. However, annotators outside of it think that it does look like one. The same... Um, the same patterns are true between in-region and out-of-region uh, annotators for many different objects, such as uh, cooking pots be beyond the storefronts. And in general, our findings here suggest that the annotators located in different regions vary in, what, in how they consider uh, that object should, uh, should appear, so how accurate a visual representation is uh, from their perspective. When it comes to visual appeal, uh, what we did here is um, ask uh, the annotators whether they considered some of the images that were shown to them appealing, like, or which uh, of the image was more appealing to them. And uh, here we show examples when annotators agree or uh, disagree, respectively, that one image is more appealing than the other. Uh, we find that consistent appeal can occur when one sample has significantly lower visual quality. However, this agreement is lower when the annotators are shown to high quality images. Annotators often consider realistic images uh, more appealing, but they also interpret appeal in contradictory ways, somewhat contradictory ways, when they prioritize background aesthetics, for example, or stereotypes or the niceness of uh, the objects that are presented. So uh, to wrap up this annotator study with some findings, so what we did is we contrasted the result of the human annotation with the common automatic metrics that we had used uh, for the previous analysis and noted that human preferences vary notably across different geographic locations. Annotators in different locations often disagree whether exaggerated or stereotypical depictions of a region are considered re geographically representative of their region. And so when annotating for geographic representation, um, visual appeal and object consistency, it is important to include this in-region versus out-of-region uh, annotators to understand the nuances of, uh, of the findings. Uh, moreover, multiple annotations per region are ideal for capturing within region variations as well. So up to now, we've seen a bunch of analyses uh, to try to understand whether generative models can be used as um, world models. And we've seen that we've made a huge progress in image quality, we've seen that we have done also some progress in consistency, in uh, prompt generation consistency, but uh, for diversity we've seen the opposite trend where we have seen that uh, models uh, that appear earlier in time tend to show more diversity than the most recent ones. And so next uh, I'll present a couple of contributions that we've had uh, in order to try to improve prompt consistency and later on to try to improve uh, generation diversity. So let's start with improving consistency. This is done via prompt optimization, and I'll explain in a second what that means. And this is a, um, a model that, or a, a pipeline that we called uh, opti 2 uh, So this is how the pipeline looks like. So we start with a user prompt. Uh, in this case, the user prompt reads a raccoon wearing formal clothes, wearing a top hat, and holding a cane. Um, the raccoon is holding a garbage bag, an oil painting in the style of Vincent van Gogh. Um, so th this prompt is fed to a state-of-the-art text-to-image model, and this text-to-image model gives us a, a bunch of generations. I'm showing here a couple of them um, to illustrate uh, what happens. What we see here is that some elements of the prompt, like the raccoon with the formal clothes and the top hat, do appear. Uh, on the generations, but there are some elements that are completely disregarded by the model. Uh, for example, the holding a, bar, uh, holding a garbage bag part of it. 
uh, then we have this bunch of uh, generations and we feed them through a scoring function. So this scoring function can be any consistency scoring function. So the two uh, typical ones that I introduced earlier were the CLIP score and a VQA um, based uh, score. So this is a VQA based score, the DSG, uh, Davidsonian uh, scene uh, graph. Uh, score and what we see here is that well uh, the generations uh, go through the VQA with a bunch of questions and for example in the question of is the raccoon holding a garbage bag which appeared on the on the prompt the answer is no so well, based on the answers we get a, a score now uh, we will uh, feed the user prompt together with the score that we obtain to an LLM and we will ask the large language model based on the score and the user prompt to come up, to modify the prompt and come up with an optimized version of the prompt that would maximize the uh, consistency score. And we can do that several times iteratively. So we can build a, a history of a previously tried uh, prompts together with this, their score. And this becomes informative for the large language model to propose a new variation of the prompt that uh, could increase the uh, consistency score. And so if we do that uh, repetitively, we end up with an optimized um, prompt. In this case, the optimized uh, prompt reads as follows. A cultured raccoon wearing formal attire and a top hat proudly holds a cane while a nearby garbage bag is artistically included in the scene. The painting reflects the vibrant colors and texture of Vincent van Gogh oil paint painting. And now when we feed this uh, new prompt, this optimized version of the prompt to the text to image model and we get a few generations, we see that these generations more accurately reflect what was requested in the prompt. So we still have the raccoon with the formal attire, with the top hat, and uh, in both uh, cases I'm depicting here, but more often than not, now we, the generations include the um, garbage bag. And if we feed uh, these new generations through our scoring function, in this case, again, is the DSG scoring function, we see that the scoring function has uh, boosted from the initial uh, one. And so let's see some of the results that we obtained with this um, pipeline. Uh, so here I'm showing results for OptiTwi, which is the name of the pipeline, when combining different large language models with different um, text-to-image generative models. And uh, those are the solid lines. And we're comparing that with the dashed uh, baselines, which are paraphrasing baselines. So just requesting the large language models to come up with uh, paraphrases of the text prompt. Um, and what we see here, and okay, the top row uh, depicts the, the plot where we show the relative consistency improvement across different iterations. And here we depict the max. So we take, uh, for each one of the prompts, we take a set of generations. So that will be taking the result of the single generation that yielded the maximum consistency score. Whereas uh, on the bottom row, I'm depicting the same, but it's on taking the average across all of the uh, consistency scores for the generations. So what do we observe that? So these are results on MS Coco. So it means that we started with the text prompts uh, that are provided in the uh, MS Coco data set. And uh, what we observe here is that as uh, iterations progress, there is a, a trend that the um, the text prompt that the LLM comes up with yield uh, higher consistency generations. Uh, we see a dip uh, in the beginning, especially if we take a look at the um, uh, average version of the plot uh, below, and this is corresponding to the um, exploration phase uh, where uh, the LLM is still trying different um, changes uh, to the input uh, prompt and seeing uh, and getting the feedback sin signal from the scoring function. Uh, we observe similar, um, similar results for a second data set. This is the party prompts data set. So again, a collection of prompts. Uh, we see uh, here that in all cases, the opti 2 i um, results have the, this uh, tendency to increase their consistency score as the LLM provides uh, more optimized uh, versions of the prompt. And uh, all of these uh, results, uh, both the MS Coco ones and the party prompts one, show improvements with respect to the simple paraphrasing baselines. 
So uh, this is a table just uh, putting together some of the previously presented results and extended ones. So we have two methods, the Opti2i method versus the paraphrasing method, the different LLMs that were used in the process, the different text-to-image models that were used in the process. And here uh, we also change, uh, use different objective functions. So this is the scoring function, the consistency scoring fun function. So DSG is the one that I've shown you before, so the VQA-based metric. Uh, what stands for DCS is a version of the clip score, but where we uh, focus only on the noun phrases of the text prompt. So it's a decomposed version of the clip score. And what we see here is that in all uh, of the settings, so for all the combinations of scoring function, uh, LLM, and text to image model, we show uh, improvements or larger improvements over the um, improvements achieved by the baseline. Now, we've seen that this uh, increases the consistency score, but now the question is, what's the effect of uh, this uh, approach on the quality and the diversity of, uh, of the results? And that's what we try to capture uh, in the table that I'm showing here. So here I'm depicting results uh, based on the initial prompt without modification or the paraphrasing. Uh, so the LLM just asked to paraphrase some of the prompt versus the Opti2i. Um, version of the prompt. Uh, so first we have FID. Uh, FID can, is computed here on different feature extractions, so Inception v3 or Clip, but in terms of uh, FID, and if we look at the uh, Inception v3, which is the most uh, widely used uh, feature extractor for the metric, we see that there are like little, uh, very little differences. However, if we look at precision and uh, recall, so precision is the proxy for image quality and recall is the proxy for uh, diversity, we see that uh, we have um, traded uh, one for the other. So we have decreased uh, precision uh, while increasing re recall. And the explanation uh, for that is that as the LLM keeps um, updating the prompt, it usually has a tendency to result in generations that are move, that are becoming farther and farther away from our reference data set, it's usually because of the style that appears uh, in the generations. So here are some um, visual results for that. So uh, this is an initial prompt, which was four teacups surrounding a kettle. Some uh, generations for it, uh, we see that the number of uh, teacups may not be right, but in most cases, uh, we don't uh, have the presence of the uh, kettle. Uh, then the optimized prompt is four teacups and circle a kettle, forming, forming a cohesive and picturesque tea setup. In this case, again, maybe the number of uh, teacups is not uh, uh, the right one, but we do see that the kettle uh, starts appearing. This is, again, the example of the raccoon that I have shown you uh, previously, just uh, with a bunch more uh, generations here. And so to wrap up on how to improve uh, consistency with optimization by prompting, we introduced the first text-to-image optimization by prompting framework in order to improve this prompt image consistency. We showed that uh, Opti2i, the framework, can be effectively applied to different combinations and uh, leads to boosts in performance in consistency. The choice of uh, consistency score is uh, rather important. So what we observed uh, was that complex prompts, such as the ones that are present in the party prompts uh, data set, appear to significantly benefit from more detailed uh, scores, such as the, vision, uh, the visual question answering ones. Um, qualitatively, what we observed is that optimizing prompts oftentimes translate into emphasizing initially ignored elements in the generated um, uh, images by either changing, uh, either adding details or changing the position of the words, uh, words in the sentence. So now we've seen how we can uh, use optimization by prompting in order to improve consistency. Now let's see what can we do about um, diversity. And so this is improving diversity with uh, contextualized then this core guidance. So this is a quick background uh, on diffusion models. I will believe you'll uh, get additional details in other lectures. <laughs> uh, but as you may all know, diffusion models are generative models, and so they, uh, their aim is to learn the data distribution. 
during their training process, what they do is that they estimate the score function um, with a neural network. The score function is the one that is uh, highlighted on the slide. And then the score is used to reverse the sampling process to generate new samples. And so in diffusion models, there is also the concept of uh, guidance. And so this is for conditional generation. And in this uh, case, we may leverage class labels or text prompts. And so we need to model the conditional score function. So bef before we had the score uh, function, which was not conditional, here we're adding the conditioning, which uh, is the y uh, on the equation. And this uh, conditioning may be a class label or a text prompt. So we have the same score function as before. Um, what, uh, but in a conditional way, what's added uh, here is uh, the guidance that may come from, uh, for example, a pre-trained uh, classifier, or uh, sometimes these diffusion models are trained uh, to use the classifier-free uh, uh, guidance as well, so they don't rely on external pre-trained classifiers. Um, so what we do here is we extend this toolbox of guidances in uh, diffusion models and introduce the idea of a uh, Vandy score guidance. So, and we use the Vandy score instead of a classifier, for example, which would be the case in uh, conditional um, generation. So what is the Vandy score? The Vandy score is a metric um, that is used to measure the diversity of a given set of images. This Vandy score does not require a reference data set. And uh, intuitively, it measures the effective number of examples that are in a data set of images. Um, so the computation goes as follows. So we have a set of images. We extract uh, embeddings for each one of the images in the data set. And then we compute the similarity matrix across all of these uh, images. And then we can compute the effective uh, rank of the, of the similarity matrix in order to get the Vandy score. So again, intuitively, what it's measuring is the effective number of examples that appear in a data set of images. Uh, and so here is how this uh, is added uh, to the function that we presented earlier. Uh, so again, uh, we have the, the conditional score function. Uh, as before, we add uh, a term to, to this conditional score function, which is uh, the Vandy score uh, function, and which relies on a memory bank of generated images. And it also relies on the DDIM approximation uh, at each uh, given uh, time step. But let's see this in more detail in the next uh, slide. Um, so this is how the pipeline uh, would look. So we start, uh, this is just like how the generative models pipeline without the guidance, without the Vandy score guidance looks. So we have noise, we have a prompt, for example, a car in region, we get a generation. Now uh, we get some of the generations. These generations here are like cars in Africa on the top and uh, cars in Europe uh, in, in the bottom as provided by one state-of-the-art model. And what we do here is uh, introduce this memory bank of generated images. So every time we generate an image, this image goes to the memory bank. And uh, this is done such that the next image generation that we do, we want it to be uh, as dissimilar as possible as the ones that are already in our memory bank. And we do that through the Vandy score uh, guidance that I introduced earlier. So intuitively, again, this uh, Vandy score, what it's doing is maximizing the effective number of dissimilar examples uh, in our memory bank. And here are some of the results. So again, those are depictions of uh, cars in Africa and cars in Europe as uh, generated by the model with the Vandy score guidance. So we do see that compared to what we had before, we see that the generations of car cars in Africa now also contain sedan-like cars, not only SUVs, uh, but the, the, their condition is still relatively uh, rudimentary. Um, so what we introduced is the contextualization for uh, the Vandy score. And uh, the idea behind the, uh, the contextualization is to show some exemplar images to uh, the process so that the images that we generate become as dissimilar as possible to each other, but while still uh, get, being relatively close to these exemplar images that we are providing. 
And so again, intuitively, this contextualization of the Venn score guidance is maximizing the effective number of the similar examples in our memory bank while keeping them close to a small set of representative or exemplar real images. And this is the effect of doing that. So again, for reference, if we follow the first line, these are depictions, uh, generations of cars in Africa. So we still uh, have variations in SUV or sedan-like uh, cars, different colors, um, different shape, uh, different condition as well. Background uh, still uh, rural in all cases, but we increase the diversity. So. What does this mean quantitatively? So we compared uh, the proposed approach to uh, prior art. So the colored part of the bars uh, here is the F1 score of the region that led the, rest, the, the worst result. So here the F1 score is the combination between uh, precision and recall, or precision, and, so realism and diversity. Uh, so again, the colored part is uh, the, uh, the result corresponding to the score of the region that got the, the worst score, and uh, the gray part on top of it is um, the, the average score across regions. And uh, what we see with this uh, slide is that uh, leveraging the contextualized uh, Vendi score guidance, we are able to improve um, the, the results, the, previously, the previous results, especially if we compare to the vanilla baseline, uh, which is the first one, the LDM, um, or variations of it like LDM with synonyms, so that would be the same prompts but changing them by leveraging uh, synonyms or by leveraging paraphrasing. So here are some of the visual results. Uh, so these are for uh, cooking pots. The first uh, part is uh, the vanilla generations of the LDM model. And uh, on the right side, we have the contextualized Fendi score generations for uh, the same model. Uh, the rows, the first row corresponds to uh, the generations when prompted with Africa, second row Europe, third row uh, East Asia. Um, and what we see here, if we focus on the first row, for example, is that by leveraging the contextualized Vendi score guidance, we end up with um, less um, depictions of uh, relatively rudimentary cooking pots and what we get rid of this uh, outdoors or unrealistic placing of uh, cooking pots in outdoors uh, scenes. These are the examples that I have already shown uh, in the previous slides uh, for cars, uh, just uh, showing them side by side. So what we see, for example, in, in the middle row for Europe is that we see that there is a more of a rural background that starts appearing, whereas before uh, this didn't happen. <coughs> And um, to wrap up uh, on this contextualized Vendi score uh, guidance or a way to improve diversity of the generations, uh, first, we extended the guidance toolbox of diffusion models by driving the generation process towards samples that are substantially different from each other while still being representative of the real world by grounding uh, on these exemplar exa um, examples. We showed that the contextualized Vendi score can be effectively used to produce images with a higher intra and inter region diversity without uh, compromising the image quality or prompt generation consistency. So, those are results that I didn't have time to present uh, today, but if you're interested in them, uh, you can find them in our paper. Uh, and we showed that by leveraging the contextualized Vendi score guidance, uh, we were able to reduce uh, the disparities across um, different regions. And this uh, was a bit noticeable in the plot that I shown, like if we compare the, um, the worst uh, region results versus the average result across regions. Uh, our qualitative analysis revealed that the diversity of the generated images is significantly improved, including along the lines of reductive region portrayals that were present in the original model. And so we hope that this work is a step towards text to image gener generative models that reflect the true geographical diversity of the world. I'll now uh, go, over, go over the uh, 
the second question that we posed in the beginning of the talk, and this will be much shorter because it will only cover one of our works, uh, but the goal here is how can we, to answer the question of, or to start answering the question of how can we query generative models to produce samples that are useful for the machine learning model 2.0. So if we go back to uh, what we had in uh, the beginning, we had like these uh, two models interacting with each other, the machine learning requesting data from the world model and the world model producing data for uh, the machine learning model in order to use it to train itself and improve its own performance, so gain new uh, skills. And so for this particular um, contribution, uh, we use a machine learning model 2.0, which is an image classification model. And uh, as a model of the world, we use a pre-trained state-of-the-art conditional text-to-image uh, diffusion model. And uh, the querying the model of the world, we do that with uh, feedback guidance. So we leverage feedback from a classifier uh, to the diffusion model in order to generate samples that are useful to improve the performance of the classifier itself. So if we go back to the guidance in diffusion models that we had before, so this is the conditional uh, score function. Uh, we had the part of the function that um, may uh, require a pre-trained classifier, uh, depending on how the model, uh, diffusion model is trained. But what we do here is uh, similar to what we did with the Vendi score, which is add a term to this conditional score function. So this is the term that now appears on the slide. Before, this is where we had the contextualized Vendi score. Here we have any criteria that uh, may uh, leverage a model, a classifier model that is being trained. So let's see how this uh, works uh, step by step. So uh, this uh, first attempt to, do, to doing that, um, we didn't consider the case of training the model with synthetic data exclusively. So it's going to be a combination of a real data set plus uh, synthetic um, data. So we start with a data set of uh, real images, an imbalanced uh, data set. And we use this imbalanced data set to train an image classifier. Then uh, we use a criteria on top of this image classifier, which in the case of the next slide will be the entropy of the classifier in order to generate samples. So we want to generate samples that produce high entropy for the classifier that we have pre-trained. Once uh, we have these uh, generated data, we mix the real data with the synthetic data and we train the classifier again. So here is the effect of the feedback guidance. So here I'm depicting on the left some samples from the uh, real uh, data set. In the middle, that would be vanilla generations from a pre-trained diffusion models. And the last uh, block would be the feedback guided uh, generated data. Uh, what we notice here is that by leveraging the feedback, the generations become more diverse in the number of uh, pumpkins that appear, the colors, and the backgrounds. So some results on the ImageNet uh, long-tailed uh, data set. So we stratify the results into classes many that have many examples, medium that has a medium number of examples, and few, which have very few um, examples. And we compare the method to two kinds of uh, methods. So the first group, those are methods that do not uh, leverage synthetic data from a generative model. Instead, what they do leverage is a synthetic data coming from applying uh, data augmentation, for example. The second block of methods, those are methods that do leverage uh, synthetic data from a generative model. And the last row is uh, the classifier guidance by leveraging the entropy of the classifier. And uh, what we see here is that uh, leveraging the feedback guidance uh, shows to be useful uh, when compared to the baselines. And I'm referring specifically here to the baselines that do um, leverage the synthetic data coming from a generative model. So we can see what's uh, the effect of the number of synthetic samples here on the test accuracy for the class uh, few, so the classes that have only a few uh, samples to begin with. Um, and what we see here is that with the feedback guidance, increasing the number of uh, synthetic samples keeps increasing the results up to the last point where we see a drop, and this might be uh, an issue related to the diversity that we get in the new uh, samples there. And maybe more interestingly here, we see that 
um, by leveraging half of the samples than the previous baselines, we are still able to um, outperforming. And this uh, highlights the uh, interesting part of adding these uh, feedback guidance to the diffusion models to drive the generation process towards uh, samples that are um, useful for the classifier being trained. So here are some additional uh, results on other data sets. I won't go too much into the details, but the blue baselines are the ones that do not leverage synthetic data from a generative model. The orange ones do leverage. And the same for places LT in both cases that we showed that the LDM with feedback guidance, so the last um, bar, uh, outperforms the previous results. So um, what we've shown in this last work is that the effect of leveraging feedback guidance uh, from a pre-trained classifier to generate data. Uh, by leveraging this feedback guidance, we showed that we can achieve state-of-the-art results in a number of tasks by showing improvements of 4 to 5% uh, on, on the represented uh, or um, in minority uh, groups in the original data sets. And uh, we hope that our framework paves the road uh, towards effectively leveraging these high, perform high performant text to image models as data sources or as world models that can be queried to improve downstream performance. So to start wrapping up um, this uh, talk, so we started with the question, are state of the art image generative models optimized to work as world models? So we saw a number of analyses, but the conclusion of uh, most of the analysis pointed that progress in text-to-image models has been driven by image quality improvements, and that progress in image quality has come at the cost of diversity of the generations. We've seen how consistency may be improved by uh, leveraging optimization by prompting, by leveraging large language models and uh, that representation diversity may be improved by guiding the generation process to produce higher diversity samples. The second question that we asked ourselves was, how can we query or control the generative model to produce samples that are useful for the machine learning downstream model? And so we saw that leveraging feedback from a model being trained um, was uh, useful in order to boost the performance of uh, it, this uh, same model. Uh, and I didn't have the time to show it in the slides, but we tested different criteria, and of course, different criteria yielded notably different results. And so it remains an open question, what's the best way uh, to query uh, these world models? Um, however, what I wanted uh, to note before wrapping up is that these state-of-the-art models in these conditional generation state-of-the-art models have been, in many cases, trained on large-scale data sets from the internet. And uh, those may contain uh, undesirable content. They may contain, they may not be representative of the entire uh, diversity of the world. And they may raise consent or privacy uh, issues, among others. And so there is a question as to uh, whether relying on these pre-trained models um, is um, the only way forward or whether it should be some um, data set work at the pre-training stage and curate data sets that may by themselves be uh, beneficial in uh, all the axis of performance that we've uh, been discussing today. And so here are some thoughts on uh, bridging the gap between state-of-the-art conditional generative models and effective world models. Um, so some thoughts include increasing representation diversity, as we've seen, without, so that would be our goal, increasing the representation diversity without sacrificing the generation quality nor the prompt consistency. Um, or thinking on reducing the model bias the mo or increasing the model diversity while maintaining factuality and model utility. Knowing, so enabling uh, the models to know uh, when not to answer or when to correct their answers. So building, for example, safety guards into the model. Um, in the case of generative models, controlling for deep uh, fakes, for example, uh, images with uh, celebrities or improving the robustness of image watermarks. And those are all um, important steps towards building better models of the world. 
So before I wrap up, I wanted to thank all of my collaborations, uh, my collaborators. I think like all of this work wouldn't have been possible with uh, all of them. And uh, I'm leaving here some references of the papers that I uh, used in this talk. And I thank you all for your attention and I can take questions.